do this, and we're going to report into the monster whatever we could find that would come out with the judgment. There was too much stuff on this. Well, they said, well, can't you see the Jews on the next day? Well, what, what the independent, I'm, I'm guessing, what the independent monitor is going to say, they're going to say ABC is doing this, uh, CBS is doing this, Showtime is doing that, HBO is doing this. There will be some criticisms of some people. Second, the independent monitor will say during the hours when children watch the most, this is what is happening. Third, this is what is happening in terms of violent promos. And fourth, this is what is happening in terms of trying to give the right kind of a message on violence. And uh, that will be public. It will make the news. The public will be able to respond. And if the monitor report is such and it is combined with public dissatisfaction, then legislation is inevitable no matter what Paul Simon or anyone else says. But I think monitoring is a way of keeping, uh, meaning no disrespect to Tony and Marty and everyone else, but keeping uh, the conscience of the industry attuned to something that is a real problem in our society. Well, first of all, you can write your story in February. Second, if uh, you want to make the news and you want to really call, uh, call attention to this, you're going to have to have a limited number of responses. Whether it's twice a year or once a year, uh, it has to be limited. And then it will have an impact. And, uh, and I think the idea of an annual report by the monitor makes sense. Address that for yes. one sec. Yeah. Uh, on the notion of something happening in February, I mean, you all know very well that at 10 o'clock the next morning, the ratings are dropped on all of our desks. Uh, we hear from our viewers much more often, I suspect, than do the elected officials up here. Uh, we hear from our advertisers before the show even goes on the air. Uh, this notion that we are not without uh, correcting mechanisms already is a flawed notion. And uh, you know, you all ought to give us a chance to get one of these done and, and see what happens. Uh, and Senator Simon, if we don't do it right, uh, not only are all of you going to come down on us, all of Senator Simon's colleagues are going to come down on us. Um, give us a chance here. Frank, if the broadcast networks go their own way and appoint their own independent monitor, would that monitor still be reviewing the cable channels as well? One of the things that we want to talk to the monitor about uh, is I mean, for it to be useful for us uh, for future programming decisions, we would like the monitor to place his judgments about our programming within the context of all of the other video delivery into the home, whether it's cable or now direct broadcast satellite, blockbuster video. Uh, we would like to have some sense of where we stand. And uh, we think that would be a useful measurement to help judge the job we are doing. Is the monitor going to monitor every show on television? I mean, from Tom Nix to Mary Tyler Moore. I have no idea. I mean, there are 1,100 hours on, of prime time on CBS alone in a year. Uh, you know, short of you know, hiring the ent entire you know, Commerce Department to do that. I mean, those are the kind of questions that we will have to take up with the people that we talk to about being the monitor. Um, I simply, I can't answer those kinds of procedural questions at this point. It is a large logistical undertaking, and we're going to have to get somebody with the resources to do it properly. Frank, this morning, I believe, Mr. Cox said that the cable was going to develop an independent uh, rating. Uh, we have, uh, in one sense, a rudimentary rating system at the moment by having the parental advisory. Uh, we are not, we have resisted and I think we'll continue to resist the notion of doing actual, you know, MPAA-like ratings uh, for a number of reasons. As I stated, well, 
this is Jack Valenti's statistic, not mine, the MPAA rates about 600 hours of programming every year. There's 1,100 hours on CBS alone, just in prime time. Uh, a movie is done months in advance and submitted to the ratings board. Uh, sometimes our sitcoms show up at the network an hour before they're going to be broadcast. There, there are a number of logistical problems. Moreover, I think if we did go to a rating system, most of what we would have on is either G or PG, and I'm not sure how terribly useful that would actually be to parents, as opposed to uh, the advisories, which from the feedback we have gotten from real live parents who are television viewers, uh, they seem to like the system. One of my great hopes is that you guys wouldn't succeed in getting uh, getting us to be in a divisive situation here. I think that you know broadcast and cable are all part of the television family delivering entertainment programs uh, into the home, and, and I think it's much better that if we we sit here and try to figure out ways to work together than to draw lines in the sand. So I'm just going to duck that question for now. For now. I, listen, you, what you're hearing is viewpoints expressed as of this afternoon on, the, on this given date. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of dialogue that's going to be held. Do you expect the broadcast to become part of the U.S. Library? I don't know. Oh, I, listen, I can't imagine we're not going to talk. Uh, you know, that really, this conference this afternoon with this... No, 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 no. I think that it, it, I, my own judgment is it would be useful if we agreed on, on, on common points of reference and, and did it uh, in a unified way. If, if, if there's a benefit to having it done independently, that would be fine, too. I think it's a little bit premature at this point to, uh, to look for definitive... Uh, uh, descriptions on how we're going to do it. I think uh, you know tomorrow morning we should get going and develop, uh, begin to develop the plan. And, and as Marty said earlier, we don't want to go. We don't want to prescribe how we want to be monitored. We are looking for that expert, independent expert who can come to us and say, "Here's our idea on how the best way to go at it is," and they and we should do it together. So I think a little openness, and this is probably uh, at this point certainly the better way to go. One more question. Well, clearly if legislation goes through that is going to subject us to several more layers of reports and uh, regulatory mechanisms, uh, we are certainly going to review at that point whether uh, the monitoring still makes any sense. We, we are doing this, right? Senator Simon is kind when he met with Howard Stringer and me some time ago to talk about this. I believe his exact words were, if you're hit by a bus tomorrow, I'd like to know that the progress you've made is not going to be undone. Uh, we, are trying, we are looking for ways to reassure people that as an industry, we take this issue seriously, we accept our corporate and personal responsibility, uh, and that therefore legislation is unnecessary. If, if people go ahead and legislate, uh, then we will take stock of what our situation is at that time. Thank you. Also, while monitoring is important, in my opinion, is a file there is an agreement among people who are in the leadership position now that we have to have less glorified bodies. If a year from now a film uh, or a series that is violent runs away with the Nielsen ratings, my society, and this is only one of the causes of violence, not the cause. But I think we're going to see an improvement in our society as a result of the action taken by both cable and broadcast, and I'm pleased uh, to be here as part of that. I'd like to introduce... Thank you, Senator Simon. Uh, before I start, I would like to acknowledge Senator Simon's leadership uh, particularly on this issue of the use of a monitor 
and that's why monitor the violent program. Actually, uh, Senator, something uh, expressed, I think, publicly last August in Los Angeles about the need for a monitor. Um, I think that with the seeds that are uh, more improved that we're seeing today, and we, we do owe you the uh, all of television that you need. Thanks, Gary. Um, the cable programmers have uh, to report on the violent programming that uh, our various networks have. So we are uh, very supportive of it. Uh, we think it makes sense. We think the use of a monitor uh, eliminates, helps eliminate the need for any legislative uh, solutions here. And I think working with the broadcast industry, uh, I think that we have to take our responsibility. So, Senator, we thank you. One way I meant, I meant to mention in my opening remarks that uh, the ideal answer is for the industry to resolve this problem themselves without government intrusion. And I make clear problems whenever the federal government gets involved in these things. But uh, I think we have an answer here that uh, moves us in the direction that we should move without government intervention. I'm pleased now to call on Marty Franks, the Senior Vice President for uh, Washington for CBS Networks. Marty? Just over a year ago, we promulgated joint standards on violence. Last May, we each announced 1993-1994 programming schedules that have been widely recognized as being less violent. Last summer, we put forth the Advanced Parental Advisory Plan to warn parents of violent content and programs that might not be appropriate for children. Today's agreement to undertake an annual joint public assessment of our programming is yet another voluntary step being taken by the broadcast and coupled with the new initiatives announced by the cable industry will persuade the Congress that legislation in this area, which is fraught with constitutional peril, is unnecessary. A final check, we'll see what happens. And if three years from now um, we we have some problems, we'll have to reassess. But the trend is clearly in the right direction. And I think the monitoring, because that, that will be an annual report. Let, let me make clear, we're not talking about pre-censoring. This is not a Hayes Commission. We're talking about exert itself or have reason to, to claim status as a major world power, I think that the, uh, the ingredient for that is are there strategic forces as Russia inherited them from the former Soviet Union. So whatever other, uh, bear in mind there are a lot of things they are not going to be able to do, they're not going to be able to modernize, but I think they will attempt to make modest upgrades. Conventionally modernized. Sir? Conventionally modern. Conventionally, yes, sir. I think a lot of that is uh, they're going to forego, but for their strategic forces, uh, both their land-based ICBM force and their uh, and their submarine-borne uh, uh, ballistic missile force, they will continue to sustain those forces and uh, maintain their readiness and and modernize them. In case the SS-25s and the and the Typhoons and Delta IV missiles, which is what will they are allowed to have under the provisions of START anyway. Let me ask you this. Uh, it's, it's my understanding that they're continuing to develop new uh, ICBMs and SLBMs. Do, we ha do you have a report that you can give us generally on the status, or is that uh, best reserved for it? Well, sir, the, the, this is a, this is a, it's a key question because th there, there is evidence around that th there is interest in sustaining R&D on, on a wide variety of, uh, of weapon systems. Uh, the issue, th of course, is how, to what extent they'll be able to enter in any of that into series production. My own view is that they, the, the, the Russians, for economic reasons, are going to be seriously constrained on the number of weapon systems they can actually field uh, and produce. In the case of conventional weapons, I think a lot of it's going to be driven by uh, how much sales they're able to generate since they are uh, hungering for hard currency. But I think they will make uh, modest improvements as permitted under, under START for those systems they will be continued to uh, uh, 
be, that they will be permitted to field. And, and they did, did they not uh, uh, adopt a new military doctrine last year which heavily emphasizes uh, nuclear forces and abandoned the old no first uh, use pledge? Yes, yes, sir, they did. But I, again, I don't find that uh, illogical. And, and given their, uh, the extremist situation they're in, well, they, they do not have a ready, large, Warsaw Pact-type uh, legions of motorized rifle divisions no, kind of force I, I anymore. So I, I, the way they're compensated for that, at least both psychologically and politically, I think, is, is uh, to temper the, the uh, no first use. But I just wanted to point out that this, uh, this predated Mr. Zirinovsky. Yes, sir. I mean, you know, we're... Yeah, can I make a point on yeah. that, sir? I think uh, General Clapper stated quite rightly, if I can paraphrase, that uh, Russia is determined to remain a great power and will maintain significant military capability. At the same time, I find it hard to characterize a country as imperialist, which was, has withdrawn back into its own country close to a million forces over a period of about five years. That has cut its procurement by some 80% over the same period military procurement by 80%, and whose military doctrine states that it will continue and complete the withdrawal of forces from outside of its own borders within two years and would only station forces outside its borders by mutual consent uh, with the country where they're stationed. Oh, but that doesn't, is that a little bit strained when, when you start listening to them talking about the near abroad and, uh, and, and the... Uh, uh, the presence of Russian nationals and, uh, and other kinds of things. I mean, I guess I'm not accusing them, and I didn't intend to accuse them of being imperialist, but certainly some of what you are hearing is not, uh, not uh, describable as a country that is totally w going to withdraw. Uh, I think that some of what you are hearing uh, is right, comes from different quarters. Uh, interesting to note that today, Mr. Uh, the Foreign Minister Kozirev, uh, arrived in Kyrgyzstan, and his first statement was to apologize to Kyrgyzstan for some of the fascist statements, his words, uh, being made in Russia today. Uh, so certainly that, uh, you know, there are forces advocating that. Uh, that's not been the policy of the Russian government. Let me just quickly shift to the last question. Um, uh, again, uh, either Mr. Wolsey or Director Wolsey or, or General Clapper, uh, I think General Clapper, you did make the statement, and it's been stated fairly uh, frequently, that no new countries will be able to threaten U.S. territory with ballistic missiles before the turn of the century. I'm assuming that you're saying with indigenously developed uh, missiles, that, but that they could, by other means, acquire uh, uh, an ability to threaten U.S. interests uh, stationed abroad or U.S. Uh, interest at home. Is that yes, correct? sir. I think that's that's exactly that's right, Senator Wall. And the and the Chinese uh, missile, uh, the, the the CSS two, having a range like that, or the or the Korean Nodong missile, might be something that would within the rest of this decade could be threatening to U.S. interests um, if delivered into the hands of other countries. Or? Any of those yes, missiles sir. of a sort of that thousand kilometer or more range could certainly reach uh, U.S. Uh, forces stationed abroad <laughs> from countries such as uh, North Korea or a country to which China might sell uh, uh, a longer range ballistic missile. And also countries that have uh, 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 two-stage missiles can uh, work on three-stage missiles. Uh, the, this, uh, this, uh, but in terms of a, a, a new country indigenously developing a missile of the range required to hit the U continental United States from, from that same country, uh, we do not believe that will occur within the decade. I, I don't quarrel with that, but that, that's that same old argument as to what constitutes a strategic missile. If it can hit you, it's strategic as hell, no matter how far or how short a distance it had to travel. U.S. bases abroad, certainly, U.S. allies, uh, these will all be uh, at risk. Uh, some are today and some will be very soon from uh, ballistic missiles in the hands of some very unattractive countries. And neither we nor our allies yet have yet developed uh, an adequate missile defense. And that remains, among other things, the only thing that threatens us and our allies. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Luger. Mr. 
Chairman, I wanted to uh, examine with the, the witnesses uh, comments about Russia and Ukraine. I, I appreciate that for purposes of this uh, general statement, it was your uh, intent to uh, be even-handed, and I don't mean to push you into being alarmist, but in the statement on page 11, despite the December election, we believe that President Yeltsin will push ahead with reforms, but the pace will be slower as political pressures force compromise. Our major concern is that looser fiscal and monetary policies aimed at easing the pain of reform will unleash forces that could bring Russia again to the brink of destructive hyperinflation. Uh, perhaps since you wrote that, uh, or maybe you wrote it yesterday, and, and it takes into consideration what has occurred, but, uh, but clearly it would, it would appear that the central bank situation is going to be one of credits going to state-run industries. That, that has been the policy determined as the social safety net to continue to provide employment uh, as opposed to uh, a program of